uh, explaining the role of money in actually causing growth in the economy, which is what the, it covers the, the loanable funds argument against considering debt. But the thing I haven't done yet is consider the post-Keynesian objections, because the arguments that are made by... Well, there are some post-Keynesians who agree with me, quite a few who don't, OK? So it's not... It's one of these things which is organic. It's still developing over time. But the people who think they've got something wrong in including debt in aggregate demand, and they were partially right, OK? I made a mistake. Um, they were saying there's, this, there's an identity between expenditure and income. If you have an exchange economy and people spend money, then the person spending becomes somebody else's income. So there's a necessary identity of the two. And what I was arguing initially was trying to argue there's a time sequence going on. So you have, initial, you have an initial uh, level of spending going on and then uh, somebody takes out debt. That pumps up both demand and income in a discontinuous way. Um, but I couldn't get that acceptance of that. Some people accepted it, others didn't. So in the debate I had in the review of Keynesian economics from the end of last year, 2014, uh, you saw the comment from Brett Feiberger saying that unless I can find some e explanation for how expenditure does not lose income to somebody else, and I should break with the idea of trying to show the difference between the two. And something I'll talk about more than when I give the final mathematical lecture, a lot of what Brett was saying was around trying to put period timing on everything, and so this happens in period t. This happens in period t minus one. My opinion is, of becoming somebody with a dynamic systems background, the whole idea of period analysis is one of the main things hobbling post-Keynesian economics. It's a very bad way to do dynamics, and in particular, uh, well, a lot of reasons behind it. But in this particular case, a lot of the logic disappears when you try to do period analysis. Everything interesting happens between the periods which means you can't actually capture it properly. There's a lovely paper by uh, Gonza, uh, um, hang on, I think Gonzalo Fonseca, but it's Giuseppe, Giuseppe Fontana, who's uh, at Leeds, comparing what's called the structural approach to the horizontal approach in, in endogenous money. And he makes the point that when you try to put this all together, you find all the interesting stuff happens between the periods. But it's period analysis itself, which is a problem, and I'll talk about that when I talk about the maths and that final extra lecture I'm going to give. But Brett's objections gave me an idea, and that is that can I possibly derive the argument that change in debt plays a role in aggregate demand from expenditure tables? Because if you set up the arrangement between uh, people in a society, if you think in a neoclassical agent type way, or sectors in an economy, if you think the way the post-Keynesians do, then I can show expenditure and income on the one table. And that's the idea of this this, this concept here. We're going to have three sectors. I'm not going to bother making you know, consumption, investment, agriculture. It's called the MES1, S2, S3. And show expenditure by each sector, which is not debt financed, as E subscript XY, where that stands expenditure by sector X buying something from sector Y. Okay. So that's just looking at expenditure on that basis alone. And I'm looking to look at three situations. One is where Borrowing simply can't happen, so there's no way you can get anything other than just, you know, the money you've got you've got on hand. Whoops, pardon me, wrong button. I'm trying to use my mouse to become a pointing device here, let's see. Okay. The other is where there's borrowing is possible from another sector. Okay, but not from a bank. So if you're going to borrow money from if sector one wants to borrow money, it's got to borrow from sector two or sector three. And the third is where you borrow from banks. So you're not borrowing from another sector now, you're borrowing from a bank. And this is the whole idea that, again, the Graziana gave us, you can't lump banks and firms together. You've got to treat them as two separate entities. Here I'm treating them as outside the expenditure to some extent. Initially I'll bring, I'll bring them in later. Um, but supplying money in the endogenous money way that the creation of money uh, does not require transferring existing money from somebody else. So the first case you might call Say's Law, but when I look about it, when I look at it, it's actually more the inverse of Say's Law, because Say's Law argued that supply creates its own demand. So if somebody supplies something, it's because they want to buy something later. But the reality is, when you think in a monetary economy, its demand creates its own supply. Because if you didn't have the monetary demand for something, it doesn't matter how much you might want it, people aren't going to give it to you. So demand creates the supply in that sense, and that's uh, even that's a bit worthwhile little minor insight here. So showing this in terms of a, a table comparing uh, expenditure by one group and another, 
what I have there is going horizontally I'm looking at expenditure and therefore income coming in as well. So the minus here is expect sector one expending, so it's making accounts falling. So the amount of money the sector one's got is going down. Why is it going down? Because it's spending that money on sector two and sector three. Okay? So the negative here is expenditure by sector one. That necessarily equals where it spends the money. So because you sum the rows, they necessarily sum to zero. Okay? Vertically, it's a different story because here I'm looking at the income versus the expenditure. So there's expenditure by sector one on sector two and sector three, which has to sum to zero. But down this way, that's expenditure by sector one on sector two and three. This is spending by sector two and three on sector one. But it doesn't have to be zero. So that is actually going to give you net income. That's why I'm calling it net income. But if you then look at this as a model of an overall economy, then the sum of the diagonal there, mathematics, mathematicians call that the trace of the matrix, the sum of the diagonal is aggregate demand. Okay? Whereas the sum of the off-diagonal elements is aggregate expenditure. Oh, pardon me, wrong way around. <laughs> Great to record this one. The sum of the, of the horrors, the, the, the diagonal is aggregate expenditure. Okay? If the spending by sector one on the other two sectors, spending by two, spending by three. That's aggregate expenditure. Aggregate income is the off-diagonal elements. So if I take the negative sum of the diagonal, I've got aggregate expenditure. If I take the off-diagonal elements, the sum of those is aggregate... Um, whoops, I'm on the wrong button again. This is going to end up well on YouTube. So there's aggregate, exp aggregate expenditure. And aggregate income is all the other elements. And they're necessarily equal to each other. Okay? So in that case, let's say we add them all up. If you add them up, clearly expenditure is identical to income. The sum of the negative sum of the diagonal, exactly the same as the sum of all the off diagonal elements. What about loanable funds? Well, here with loanable funds, imagine you, if this is money you're going to be spending at a particular point in time, and you've got two choices. You can spend it or you can lend to somebody else. So I'm looking at the spending now, still saying that's what spending e, e, x, y is what spending would be by sector x and sector y if it didn't lend. But if it does lend, then its spending's got to fall by that amount to match the fact that it's lent that money to somebody else rather than spending it. It actually gets easier to understand when I talk in terms of a flow. So I'm going to say sector 1 borrows delta D from sector 2, which means therefore sector 1 spending can go up by delta D, but sector 2 spending has to fall by delta D. Now you can then break it down and say sector 1 will spend part of that change in debt on sector 1 and part of that uh, sector 2 and part of the debt on sector 3. So call the proportion alpha and 1 minus alpha. But equally, sector two spending is going to go down by, by the same amount, partially beta on sector one, one minus beta on sector three. So you put that together, there's your pattern. So change in debt turning up all over the place now, of course. So we've got to now do those summations, and change in debt's playing a transient role here, and it may, of course, it may also affect you know, spending propensities and all this sort of jazz. You can get changes in the velocity of circulation of money. Uh, but I'm not going to worry about that in this. I feel I've shown you that in the other simulation. But f filling it out fully, before you do any cancellations, those are all the terms you get. Now, don't worry about it. It's a big mess. But when you look at what happens, you go through and say, well, let's, let's look at you know, netting out the terms in delta D, and everything cancels. You're back where you started again. Okay. So again, expenditure is income. No role for the change in debt. And this is one interesting thing that I've, I'm arguing in the paper of this is based upon that's coming out in the review of Keynesian economics in the next edition I said even though neoclassicals are in institutionally wrong about lending because they see lending as being loanable funds which isn't the case and the Bank of England is trying to tell them that logically they're correct okay? if it were loanable funds then change in debt would have no role this is partly where I started developing the argument about endogenous money having a role in macro because if it's a different institutional structure but it has no effect, why worry about it? Okay? So there has to be some reason that it matters. Now, the endogenous money, the borrower's funds are coming from a bank. So there's an increase in bank as assets of Delta D. There's an identical increase in liabilities, but there's no offsetting reduction in spending power by the other two sectors. And so you're going to spend that Delta D on the outputs of Sector 2 and Sector 3, having borrowed it from, sector, from the bank and therefore increasing the amount of money in circulation, increasing the liabilities, does change in debt turns up. Well, 
here we have the table again. Now Delta V is only turning up in the first row now because it's just affecting sector one. We do our summations and we get, again, a similar looking mess before I do any cancellations. We do our cancellations on the other term, Delta V does not disappear anymore. Instead, it turns up in both aggregate income and aggregate demand. So the change in debt is an argument in both. Now this gets to be where a bit of verbal um, shenanigans are necessary because how do you explain this? Because having gone from saying what I used to argue is aggregate demand is income plus change in debt. And I was told I'm, I'm, therefore I was breaching rules about you know, expenditure as identical to income. Now I've got to say aggregate demand is income plus change in debt and income is income plus change in debt. Okay? Well, the only way to make sense of this is to say that we have to look at the sources of demand as coming from money. And part of the money demand comes out of existing money turning over. Hence, we've got to start thinking in terms of money and the velocity of money, which has been a no-no for post-Keynesian economists for decades, courtesy of Milton Friedman. So part of it's coming up, but we've got to bring it back in. We've got to rescue the velocity from Milton Friedman. Just because Milton used it doesn't mean it's a totally stupid idea. Okay. So bring it back in again, and I'll show you in a moment. So demand is now... Aggregate demand is aggregate demand generated by the circulation of existing money plus aggregate demand caused by new debt, and aggregate income is also income out of turnover existing money plus income generated by new debt. So that's the way that you finally make sense of it. Non, there's non-debt finance expenditure plus the change in debt because when you borrow money, you're borrowing it to spend. Now, of course, you can take out a loan and have it sitting in your account and not spend it. That's feasible. Okay? But most of the time when people borrow money, like for example, if you take out a bank loan for a, for a mortgage, you, what you've taken out is the right to extend your debt to that level. Okay? But initially, you don't actually have that extended until you then buy the house and then you get the debt and you get the house and the cash to buy the house goes to the person you've bought it from, which is the sort of logic I'm looking at now. Now, funnily enough, even though it's normally harder to think in differential terms for most people, I think this logic actually is easy to follow when you say, let's, let's change from thinking about a sim single instant delta D and a single point in time to considering a flow through time. And this, ag again, is where I've got to be, those who haven't done um, mathematics to a great deal, the idea of a flow of a particular time Sometimes sound, if you're thinking in period terms, people think, oh, if you're taking a totally zero slice of time, there's got to be no change at all in that particular point in time. No. If you imagine, for example, water flowing into a dam, then you might have a, let's say a dam's got a capacity of, say, of a, a, a million megalitres of water, and it's got a flow coming into it through a river, which you could measure as being, say, a, a, a million megalitres per year. Okay. Now, if you take a particular slice in time, the rate of change of water coming into that dam, d w d t, will be a million megalitres per year. d d d t will have that value. So you're dimensioning what you're looking at by time. So you can actually just take a you know, absolute infinitesimal slice of time. It will still be correct to say that at that point, the rate of change of water into the dam is a million megalitres per year. Okay. So that's what's the same sort of logic going on here. So we've got a flow of new debt coming in. This could be 20% of GDP per year at an instant in time. So it looks like loanable funds now. And this, I've got some surprises out of doing this. This is one of the beauties of using mathematics as a tool of logic because when I set this up, I expected change in debt to have no role on loanable funds. Okay, And I expected the financing of debt, interest rate on interest being paid on deposits and interest being paid on loans to be net, okay? one against the other. I was wrong. I'll show you what happens. Um, so I've got two situations, loanable funds where there's a flow of money being lent by sector one to sector two, and endogenous money where there's a flow of money being lent by the banking sector to sector one. And now when I'm using S1, S2, S3, Rather than just treating them as labels, I'm going to say, let's imagine that's the amount of money in the account at a particular point in time. Okay, so there might be you know, $100 million in sector one, $50 million in sector two, a $1 billion in sector three at a particular point in time. So to use the, to, to now talk about the flow of money being spent at a particular point in time, I'm now using the idea of time constants, which I've introduced a couple of times in this week's lecture. 
Okay, and again, the idea of a time constant is that if you d divide the stock of money by the rate at which it's flowing, you get the rate of flow per unit of time. So if we say, if we say for example, the time constant for sector one is, uh, is seven years, okay, then we're saying that given a hundred million dollars in the account, the flow out of that account will be thirteen million dollars per year. That's sort of thirteen and a bit million dollars, fourteen million dollars a year. And rather than having delta delta D, I've now got D D D T, which is a rate of change of debt, again at a particular instant in time, but denominated in years. So this might be in the case of the American economy at the peak of the boom, this might have been two trillion dollars per year was D D D T. So loanable funds, we're going to have lending from sector two to sector one. And pardon me, I'm using um, a mathematics program. This is MathCAD to do the formatting because it was just too complicated to type this in um, in um, math type inside Word, uh, which means I can't animate individual components of it. But it's just I want to show you the bits there. Those those are now the account balances: S1, S2, S3, the amounts of money that are sitting in the bank accounts of those three sectors. This bit here is the change in debt, money being borrowed by sector one from sector two and of course sector one has to pay interest to sector two so that's the rate of interest on the level of debt so once you, that's when when you bring in a flow of money over time you therefore have to also acknowledge the stock of debt that exists okay? that's what I wasn't expecting to have to do when I first put this together and I realized in fact I'm going to have the actual level of debt turning up in the equations so aggregate demand when you sum across that diagonal the negative sum and now what I'm using is the, the logic power of the software. This is, again, I find for a lot of people trying to explain mathematical logic as a pain in the butt. Okay? But the beauty of programs like MathCAD, Mathematica, Maple, and quite a few others, they have the symbolic algebra inside them. They'll do the cancellations for you. So what I've done is to find aggregate demand as the negative sum of that diagonal there in, in a little program which I call AD. Uh, LF just hands over the... Um, is, the, is the variable I'm passing to it. So I'm passing this matrix inside here. I'm saying simplify this by collecting these terms and then giving me the sum of the negatives of the sum of the diagonal. That's what the program does. And what it returns is the turnover of sector one's accounts, given the amount of money it's spending on the other two sectors, plus the turnover of sector three, two, plus the turnover of sector three, plus interest on debt. And ditto for aggregate income, same thing. So much to my amazement, interest payments on aggregate, uh, on, on the level of debt, are part of aggregate demand and aggregate income, even when you're working in loanable funds. Okay. That was a surprise. So partly what we tend to fall into is we think of financial transactions in a net sense, even when we're talking about the aggregates. Okay. So that's what I, I fell into the same trap. And I thought that would net out disappear. No, it's we're talking aggregate. That's all the money being turned over in the economy. So that was one surprise. Now, I had another surprise doing endogenous money. I got the result I expected. I'll just show you that. So here I now have the change in debt being money being lent by the banking sector. There's a flow of money dimensioned in the amount of money per year. Dollars that in America's case, as I said, that could be $2 trillion per year before the crisis hit. And of course, they've got to pay interest, but it's now being paid to the banking sector. So I've now brought BE, banking equity, inside there as a place where the money is actually being sent. That's what then enables the banking sector to buy off the productive sectors of the economy. So I'm treating S1, S2, S3 as being like you know, a couple of sectors of firms, the workers, and this is the banks being treated separately to both, of course, workers and and, and the uh, manufacturing sector. So there's payment of uh, interest, but of course, because the bank is storing the deposits of all these accounts and has paying deposit interest, it's also paying deposit interest to each of those sectors based on the amount of money that they've got outstanding in their bank accounts. So it's got to pay RD times S1 to sector one, RD times S2 to sector two, and so on to sector three. Now, when you aggregate that up, and this is again using the symbolic logic program to do it. Exactly the same expression for both aggregate demand and aggregate income, which is you know, necessarily the case. But now we've got change in debt and deposit interest and loan interest all being shown as components of both aggregate demand and aggregate income. So there's the change in debt turning up as part of both aggregate demand and aggregate income. And there's interest on existing debt 
but there's also interest on existing money. So that was a surprise. It took me a while to understand that one. I'm still getting comfortable with it, but it flows from the logic. So we now get the situation that the role of debt in aggregate demand and aggregate income, it's got to, you've got to include both of them there, expenditure and income are that financed by existing money, which is that bit in the fully stated expression, plus that financed by the change in debt, which is that bit, plus that financed by gro plus gross financial transactions effectively. So aggregate demand at the monetary level includes the turnover of all those, all those components. And exactly the same thing applies for aggregate income. So what this implies is a, a bigger generalisation of Milton Friedman's quantity theory of money. And this is, again, another point that, uh, that is an important piece of additional logic, that people look at the PV equals MT equation, you know, and Milton made all sorts of ridiculous assumptions about the nature of velocity and so on, but they've dismissed the whole thing. Well, in fact, we need to augment it. We need to include the right change of role of change of debt inside there. So when you look at Friedman, this is his equation. P times Y equals M times V. It's actually the way you define V. V velocity is just defined as the monetary value of transactions divided by the stock of money. Okay? Therefore, gives you a, a scale of telling you how many times per year that turns over. So that's the price level. That's the level of output. That's the money stock. And that's velocity which have I said, the velocity is a calculated one. What's it doing over there? I'm going to bounce too quickly. You now, what Friedman had said it was V was constant. That's nonsense. Okay. Um, also, he asserted that Y output was determined simply by real factors. Money system plays no role, which is also nonsense. He had general equilibrium, you know, all the usual neoclassical stuff inside there. And M, he argued, was completely under the control of the government. Now, this is, we made this discussion a bit earlier today. That's why he called it helicopter money, because the government was flying the helicopters over the top. All he was saying, the helicopters should be piloted by the people who believe in neoclassical economics rather than politicians. Okay. So that's his whole argument. Therefore, you control inflation completely. So he argued inflation was completely the government's fault. Now, just in terms of velocity alone, it's easy to trash the argument that it's constant. His whole a major part of his monetary history of the United States was trying to make the case that it was constant. Well, if that's a constant... I've got a bridge I'd like to sell somebody. Um, so anything but, bearing up, bearing down, pro-cyclical, highly volatile, and even, even as staunch neoclassicals as Kidlin and Prescott have come out and said they have good empirical research. So there's no way you can call that a constant. Sorry? Yeah. How, how was the graph before the 70s? Like from the yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's an intrigue. Let's just go back yeah, up and... Pardon? Because you brought the velocity of money's constant somewhere in the 70s, probably? He was actually using data right back to the 1850s and earlier, I think. It's a monetary history of the United States, which I've got somewhere on this computer. So was, was it constant before? No, no. I mean, it was varied, but he tried to downplay the variation or he tried to find... I mean, I've got to read the book fully. I've read parts of the monetary history, not the whole thing, so I'm talking through my hat a bit here. But to argue that it's constant, you would have had to bring in all sorts of modifications of the definition of money to try to say that, therefore, overall it's a constant and it's actually change in the money stock that's causing the variation rather than changes in velocity. Or he'd be saying the change in velocity is a small range or doesn't have any cyclical component to it, that sort of thing. Um, again, that's worth having a look at. And I think it is... Um, I don't think it's a downloadable... I think even the Lucas critique undermines the idea that he found it was constant because you, you, you can ask the question, how could it have been constant across all the, those, those variations in monetary policy? Exactly. Over such a long period of time, the Lucas critique will be stated. Yeah, yeah. So even like, that's a good point. Even that's worth uh, knocking it down. So here's... And this is actually beautiful. This is from his 1969 Optimum Quantity of Money paper. He actually says it quite bluntly. The central assertion of monetarism is an excessive increase in the supply of money caused by decisions of the note issuing authority of the central bank is the main, if not the sole, cause of inflation. So it's really seen just the government's central bank capacity to create money as the reason why the money supply changes, and that's been the only reason why we've got inflation. Okay? Now, that's nonsense, but 
it's still, it's, and, and his idea that velocity is constant is nonsense, but velocity itself is still a central element of what happens with the amount of money in existence. Again, thinking even in terms of what's happening in a country like Greece right now, as well as having money being sucked out of the economy by austerity and by, uh, well, for a while, by, by the private sector reducing its debt levels so that money stock is falling, that's causing people to spend less rapidly. So you're going to get a, you know, a pro-cyclical decline in the velocity of money as well as a fall in the amount around. So it's an important part of thinking how people behave and change under different circumstances. So if you correct Minsky, uh, if you take what I've shown you here, that's the equation you get. I'm leaving out now non-private non sector money creation. I could, I mean, in general, I'd make that DMDT, okay, because the change of money is not just what the private sector does, but that's your generalised equation. And that's now a dynamic equation, not the static one that Milton Friedman had. Now, one thing, again, this was not necessarily something I anticipated when I first started putting this stuff together, but it comes out of thinking in a dynamic sense. You've got to have the growth going on at the same time. You can't separate static plus growth and add growth in separately later. It's all happening at once. So this is the current existence, the M times V, current level of money. This is new demand coming into existence. It isn't just adding to the money stock. When it's first taken out and spent, it creates demand. Then it turns over with the existing amount of money. So that's a dynamic version of monetarist, the monetarist equation. So that's demand, demand and income from return of existing money. And this is demand and income from newly created money. And you've got to have them both inside there to fully understand the economy. Of course, there's another catch, and that is that you don't just use money to buy goods and services. Talking in the real world, a large part of money that's borrowed in existence now is to buy existing financial claims. So we're not actually buying a physical entity. Now, when you buy a house, you're not actually buying a house. You're buying a claim to be able to occupy the house. Okay? And then when you buy shares, you're not buying the company. You're buying financial claims on the company itself. So that's what assets, in that sense, think about them as financial claims. Now, a huge part of the money people borrow these days is to buy financial claims. You buy a house with a mortgage. Okay. You know what mortgage stands for, by the way, in Latin? Death contract. Mort. Gage. Okay. Um, so, so the, yeah. the growth of money is yeah. No, it's DDD. It's only in DDDC. Once, once it's borrowed into the instant after it's borrowed into circulation, then it becomes part of the velocity of circulation. If you imagine, and the velocity yeah. of circulation uh, defines the, the amount of money that's in existence now. Yeah. So if you think about when you go shopping with a credit card, yeah. I mean, if you you, know, you you go and buy you know thousand, spend a thousand dollars on a new computer, thousand pounds. The moment you swipe your card, you're spending a thousand pounds. Then that thousand pounds is in the bank account of Curry's, you know, and it will turn over as Curry pays its wages and you know buys inputs and distributes profit and so on. So the initial spending comes out of the DDT. Then it becomes part of the circulation. Now, of course, we're not just buying goods and services. We're also buying assets. And I'm still working out this part of the idea, but. Think about the net turnover and net asset turnover as the growth or contraction of the valuation we put on financial claims. That can come out of a change in the price of those financial claims or the quantity of those financial claims. Okay. And we're not again talking about factories, we're talking about shares. When we're talking about houses, we're talking about claims to ownership of houses. So I call the NAT for net and net asset turnover. And putting the full expression, it starts getting very messy. The fundamental bit is including the rate of change of money. So if we look at the fact that the government can create it as well, it's not just DDDT, it's DMDT, but overwhelmingly that's change in debt these days. It should be much more the government's money creation as well. But that's your overall expression, including gross financial transactions, shown in a very simplified way. So that's existing money, new money, gross financial transactions, but on the right-hand side, we over the left-hand side, rather, we have all the uses of money, buying new goods, and changing the value of existing financial claims. Now, that's the total value 
which is both the price you pay and the quantity of, of claims that exist on shares and property. So I call that, it's, that's why I call it net. I think it's the change in asset values that turns up there. But if you expand that out, what you get is the rate of change over time of the price of assets times the quantity of assets. And if you apply the chain rule, the product rule rather, to work that out, what you get is the price of assets times the change in the level of, of, of financial claims, so new shares being issued, that sort of thing, which is, exists but it's fairly minor. In fact, most of the time they're being cancelled these days by share buybacks. But the next bit is the level of assets times the change in asset prices, and of course that's highly volatile. So most of what we see turning up in NAT, net asset turnover, is going to be changing the price of assets. And that's going to be driven largely by the most volatile bit of the equation up here for the source of all this demand, which is going to be the change in money. Because money stock doesn't change all that rapidly. Because this, this is the stock, that's the flow. Okay? The flow is much more volatile than, even though the flow leaf feeds into the stock, this will be much, this can go up and down very rapidly. This won't change as much. It's the difference between differentiation and integration effectively. Velocity changes, but not as rapidly as the change in debt can be. And this is interest in existing money, interest in existing debt. Interest rates can change, of course, a bit, sometimes rapidly, but mainly most of your activity is going to come out of the change in the money supply. So if we now look at that, expand all this stuff out, you've got that very rapid change bit and that very rapid change bit. So most of our activity we're going to see turning up in the share market and the property market, but also, of course, affecting the real economy. So when you look at this now and say, this is on the left-hand side, we've got aggregate expenditure, uh, aggregate um, sales of goods and services plus sales of financial assets, lumping the two together. So if you look into that being driven by income plus change in debt. So I used to use this argument to say that if you look at America's GDP, it peaked at about $14 trillion before the crisis hit, then it went down. But if you add the change in debt on top of that, you're looking at effectively um, uh, goods and services plus activity on the financial markets. And rather than being a $14 trillion GDP economy, it was an $18 trillion monetary transactions economy. Then when you went from the rate of growth of debt being roughly $4 trillion a year to being minus two, you went from total transactions of 18 trillion to 12. Distributed, of course, not just across the asset markets with all the fall in the share market and property market, but also unemployment. So when you now look at the rate of change of that, you start getting some pretty messy terms. I didn't bother trying to expand all that out. But if I now look at the change in the level of monetary transactions versus the change in the money supply, I've got the differential of the differential of debt. So the acceleration of debt is going to turn up as a major factor in the change in our measured level of monetary transactions. And of course that's completely missed by the loanable funds model. There is what they call the financial accelerator in some of the work that Anki and co have done. That's an attempt to explain all this using the price effect, valuation effects, not seeing it as having a quantitative effect on the level of demand. So they've got a very amateur level of that but it explains the ridiculous correlations I was finding when I started exploring this idea for the first time round. I'd said, well, I'm arguing now that change in debt is part of demand, so I should assign some sort of relationship between change in debt and the level of unemployment, for example. And what I found blew my socks off. It still stuns the hell out of me because the correlations over the length of time I'm looking at are ridiculous in terms of how high they are, particularly for the American data. And you often get the cliche, and it's treated as a cliche, correlation is in causation. What that's saying is that if you correlate A and B and they're correlated to each other, there may be another factor C that they're related to that actually causes the change in both. And people then didn't. So you show people the correlation, so you get this correlation is in causation, don't think about the issue. I've got a causal argument here. I'm saying change in debt causes those changes. So I'm now exploring that causal argument with a correlation. And that's the correlation of change in debt measured as a percentage of GDP to the level of unemployment in America for 25 years. The correlation coefficient is minus 0.93. I've turned unemployment upside down so you can see it more clearly, but it's ludicrously high. And there's all sorts of issues in timing and stuff like that. They don't seem to have any impact here. It's stunningly high correlation. And one thing which, it's not as strong for England by any means, 
it's still quite strong for Japan for some in some parts, but not the entire argument, as I'll show you in a moment. I think partly that relates to the fact that even though America is much more trade exposed than it used to be, and all the relocation of production and stuff like that, it's still the most self-contained economy on the planet. It produces its... Pardon? It produces everything itself. The only other country which is comparable in that sense is Germany, and Germany doesn't have oil. Okay, so Germany's got to import a lot of its raw materials. Um, America doesn't. Okay, it produces virtually everything. So if you want... Pardon? Yeah, it's, even when you look at the scale of the, the scale of the American current account deficit, it's much. It's got a large current. It's got a large deficit on trade, but not a large deficit on the current account because it owns so much of the rest of the world. One cancels out the other. So that's you know you write about the trade side of it. If I had just the trade account, I'd show a big deficit. But the current account, because they have so many patent incomes from transnational corporations, it tends to have a minor. The, the two net out very dramatically on their foreign exchange level, so you just find it's almost like that insulates it from the fact that it's so trade exposed these days. Now that's the that's looking at the change in debt and the level of unemployment. Um, I actually met the guy who first showed you the graph I'm about to show you now last week uh, at Waterloo, a guy called Michael Biggs, because I was aware that if I argued that the change in debt leads to the level of unemployment, then there should also be a correlation between the acceleration of debt and the change in unemployment. And I simply lacked the courage to check it out because, I, first of all, I didn't think the data would be good enough to actually find the relationship. And then if I found, checked it and found sure enough it wasn't good enough, it would weaken my argument. So being a bit of a wimp for once in my life, I didn't check it. Then Mike Biggs and uh, two other people published a paper called about what they call Phoenix Recoveries, and they found the correlation. I thought, shit, I should have checked it myself. So I went and I did the data, and this is what I found for the American data. It's for part of the animation going the wrong way. That's the correlation of the acceleration of debt to the change in unemployment in America, minus 0.88. That is ludicrous to get a correlation that high. And you're looking at what's effectively a second-order effect. It's bizarre, but that's how high. So that's the scale at which the change in debt causes the level of unemployment, acceleration of debt causing change in unemployment. If I look at um, Japan, now again, this is, this is the, in many ways the acid test. How does it do for Japan? That's private debt change in unemployment in Japan. Now, I'm sure I've got all issues about stationarity and stuff like that in a particular time series. But 0.91, minus 0.91. So the only, there's only two countries I find I don't get strong relationships for, and that's Ecuador and England. I don't know why England's lower, but I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. This is the English... Oh, so this is now acceleration and change of unemployment in Japan. Not as strong a correlation as America. Still there, minus 0.32. Okay. Which is more the scale I would have expected for America. It still stuns me that I get the relationships I do for the American data. But I think you can see the general ups and downs there, including the financial crisis, including uh, 1990, when it went from a booming economy to the beginning of its slump, and so on. And that would be. That as, as soon as people start paying off debt, they don't buy people. Well, when you're paying off debt, you're actually reducing money in circulation. Mm -hmm. As well as you're not hiring people, you're reducing the money. Okay? I think also you've got to remember there's a very large skew with the Japan that will be affecting that, and that is the carry trade. So a lot of that money that's borrowed as debt in Japan finds its way over into US debt. Which I think also is the case for the English data, because the English yeah. data is nowhere near as strong. And I've got a feeling it's because this is basically the. Pardon? Oh, that explain it by, by ignoring the slide. <laughs> that, that, by the way, I can... Huh? You think so? Look, it isn't just, post, it isn't just neoclassicals that do this. If you take a look at the article I wrote in the Review of Keynesian Economics, it was with Mark Lavoie and um, Brett Feiberger to critique my argument, Tom Pally agreeing but bringing in his own variation. Uh, neither of them discussed the empirical data I included in the slide, and Mark specifically said he wouldn't discuss it. How do you not discuss something with a correlation of minus 0.9? Okay. But the post you know, classicals don't even look at it, don't even see it. Or they say, oh, I want to see the panel data study of that. And then they don't ask you about the panel data series after the seminar's over. They simp and this is what um, one of my friends sent me a nice little quote from um, uh, from um, Daniel, Daniel Kahneman, 
the book Thinking Fast and Slow. He said that what's often going on is what he calls theory-induced blindness. You don't see something unless it fits inside your theory. And even if you're shown a huge anomaly, your mind doesn't let it in. And how would Lavoie's definition of endogenous money not fit this? Mark, I think, well, Mark may come, we may, we may finally agree, okay, but at the moment he just simply says that because of, of the, um, uh, the, the, the expenditure equals income that it can't play a role. I'm still waiting. Mark and I correspond regularly. We actually play tennis together. The bastard beats me almost every time. Actually, every time so far. I've got to get even one of these days. Um, so Mark and I are good friends. I like him a lot. Uh, but we still differ over this one. But I think potentially I can persuade him. I have to wait and see what happens with the next issue of the, of the journal. Um, so, but at the moment, there is this just, you know, not looking at it because you can't find a theoretical reason as to why it should happen. And this is something which isn't just neoclassical, so we're guilty of that. I think every, it's a human characteristic, and that's why I think Koenigan's little statement about what he called theory-induced blindness, as well as the theory giving you a way of illuminating something, if you believe the theory, something the theory contradicts, the empirical data that contradicts the theory, you don't see it. So Popper, to argue people are actually wedded to the data rather than to the theory, is in a behavioural sense is wrong. We tend to be wedded to our explanations of reality and if something doesn't fit our explanations, we don't see it. There's real resistance there. So what would be the flaws in the um, Stationarity is one thing. I'm not an econometrician, so but I'm, I'm critical of econometrics. Uh, as, as think of the way that econ economists have developed econometrics. It's been excessively relied upon on linear ideas, mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you can have an error term which is normally distributed, etc., etc., which is only possible if your model actually completely specifies the system, and then they specify linear models. Pardon? Bayesian's better, but I'm not enough of an expert to make any commentary on it. But you have to have a nonlinear model. You've got to be fitting a nonlinear model to the system. If you don't fit a nonlinear model to what is genuinely a nonlinear system, then you're going to have errors with your logic, whatever other logic you use. So it's a combination of things like that. There are a range of new te techniques that have been developed mainly actually in fluid dynamics to handle this sort of stuff. Like well, nonlinear parameter estimation, nonlinear models, and nonlinear statistics, yeah. There's a sort of more popular story told about the last year that said that, uh, right, and it's sort of, I think it comes from, I don't know what's right, you've got this growth, so when it's the same growth in the face of uh, what otherwise would have been poorly growth because of increasing debt. Mm -hmm. That's a potential argument. What, what you then do is you've got a causal sequence. This is a bit like the Granger causality argument. You know, does X cause Y, does Y cause X? And a lot of people look at this and say, oh, well, maybe the decline in unemployment is actually what caused the rise in debt. Now, I've got... That is a behavioural argument. People are less... Un unemployment drops, so people decide to borrow more money. Okay? Um, whereas I'm saying a, a, an actual physical monetary causation the borrowing generates more money, which gives you more demand, which hires more people. So I've got an actual causal argument rather than a behavioural argument there. And there is, there are statistical techniques. Pardon? If there's no, no way of saying which, which one could be or it could be causal. Well, there's, there's two things. You could, I don't, I don't know whether you actually could do Granger causality on this. That would be an interesting master's or PhD thesis to do that. This, this is wide open, by the way. Nobody's done the empirical work. I've done this to correlations, that's it. So if somebody wanted to tackle this as a PhD topic, it's wide open. Okay? And the data is now available too. The Bank of International Settlements now records um, private sector debt to the household and a non-financial business at the sector level. For 30 or 40 countries across the world, data going back in some cases up to 100 years, but certainly at least 15 years worth of data for every country they record. So be possible to do that sort of range of causality testing. There's also some stuff that Devrim sent me just recently. You know, on Devrim, uh, which is looking at a new way that's been developed in by scientists and mathematicians to try to get whether X causes Y. So get causal arguments, not with all the limitations I expect to find in range of causality about linearity and so on, and normally the distributed error terms. Stuff that actually is free of all that. He said whether X causes Y. Of course, there will be a bit of a feedback. We're talking a dynamic system here. So if you do have a fall in unemployment, 
then it is likely people will also borrow money for households. The you know, household borrow might go up a bit in that basis. So there's going to be causation both ways. It's a complex system, but I think the fundamental causation is from the change in the amount of money to the level of demand. People, um, I mean, from a practical perspective, um, if you're unemployed, we're not going to lend you money. It's, yeah. it's that simple. Yeah. Uh, so people go to other sources. Yeah. Uh, there's you know, hence there's a massive explosion in like payday lenders and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Because they can't get it out of the ordinary system. Yeah. So from a causality perspective, I know from a pragmatic perspective, people unemployed or even they they look vulnerable, mm. and that's sufficient to not advance it. And the same is true for corporate lending. Yeah. So we don't lend to firms when times are getting hard. We re we I mean this is the whole final financial crisis. Even banks weren't lending to banks. The interbank yeah. liquidity markets are totally dried up. We didn't trust the other banks. Yeah. It's well, it's absolutely not going to work that way around. Yeah, that's what I'm going to be covering next week when I start talking about, not next week, the week after I start talking about Minsky. There's no way yeah. you can borrow more because they're, they're, they're having a hard time. They're just not allowed to yeah, borrow more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is another remarkable correlation. The, the margin debt, this is acceleration in margin debt and change in the level of the share price in America. Now, again, I never expected a correlation that high. I've got a second order effect against the first order effect in the most volatile bloody thing on the planet, which is the S&P 500, and yet you get a correlation like that. And this, the, the, the American, the level of margin debt in America correlates with the level of the stock market, the change correlates with the level of the stock market, and the acceleration correlates with the change in the level of the stock market. It's phenomenal how strongly the, the two are linked. But this causal relationship also applies in Australian shares, English shares, etc., etc. Now, again, I can see the causation probably going from margin debt to the share price level, but it would be equal the other way. Okay, people would see share prices rising, willing to take on margin debt, and the banks would see this as an avenue for making money by lending, as well. So, but all again, you can't deny the role of the volume of lending as part of what's driving and being driven by the level of asset prices. So that's. That's the overall answer there. That's, I, don't, I didn't know how far I'd go with the lecture today, so I've, that's what I've got for you, um, which is not quite the two hours, but um, I hope that's a reasonable way to finish on a Friday.